Friends, ladies, and gentlemen, my dear students, welcome to our online class. And I sincerely hope that you are doing well and fine in your own confines, in your homes, or wherever you are. And today, I'm going to introduce you to some foundational terms that you need to learn as we navigate human rights. Understanding these terms properly will enable us to uh, navigate in our learning, especially in these intricate uh, aspects of human rights. So sit back, relax, and let your, um, let your um, imagination fly so that we'll be able to uh, understand the terms that we need to understand. So first in the item, I would like to introduce you to the term, the principle of non-discrimination. You will be hearing this especially if you will be studying the legal aspects of human rights. You will be hearing often the word non-discrimination. So the principle of non-discrimination is a fundamental concept in human rights law. It, is essentially, uh, it essentially means that all individuals are entitled to equal treatment and opportunities regardless of certain characteristics or traits. These characteristics can include race, ethnicity, sex, religion, political beliefs, nationality, social origin, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, age, and others. And we often encounter this uh, kind of discrimination in many places in the world today, especially when people are categor categorized according to uh, these uh, categories that we have mentioned such as race, ethnicity, sex, or religion and when people are treated in a different manner and standards are applied in, in different uh, ways to different people these are the kind of things that uh, we call non-discrimination. So here are some of the issues associated with the principle of non-discrimination. The principle of non-discrimination is fundamental in ensuring fairness, equality, and justice in various aspects of society. However, there are several issues and challenges associated with its implementation and realization. And today, I'm going to highlight each of them. The first one is uh, implicit bias. Discrimination can occur unintentionally due to unconscious biases held by individuals or institutions. These uh, biases can lead to unequal treatment based on factors such as race, gender, age, disability, sexual orientation, or religion. The second thing that I would like to highlight here is also what we call systemic discrimination. Discriminatory practices can be embedded within social, economic, and political systems, perpetuating inequality over time. This system may disadvantage certain groups, such as uh, racial minorities, women, LGBTQI, plus individuals or people with disabilities. And the third one is intersectionality. Individuals often face multiple forms of discrimination that intersect with one another. For example, a woman of color may experience discrimination based on uh, both race and gender, which can compound the challenges she faces. So, another is uh, the legal loopholes. Laws and policies aimed at preventing uh, discrimination may contain loopholes or exemptions that allow for discriminatory practices to persist. Additionally, enforcement mechanism may be weak or ineffective, limiting the ability to address discrimination effectively. And number five, we also have cultural and social norms. So cultural attitudes and social norms can reinforce discriminatory behavior and beliefs. These norms may perpetuate stereotypes, stigmatize certain groups, and discourage diversity and inclusion. Then we have economic disparities. 
So economic inequality can exacerbate discrimination as marginalized groups may have limited access to resources, opportunities, and social mobility. Discrimination in employment, housing, education, and healthcare can further entrench these disparities. And seven, we have digital discrimination. So with the increased use of technology and algorithms in decision-making processes, there is a risk of digital discrimination biases in algorithms or data used in artificial intelligence system can result in discriminatory outcomes, particularly in areas such as hiring, lending, and also criminal justice. Then we have hate speech and violence. Discrimination can manifest in the form of hate speech, harassment, or violence directed at individuals or communities based on their characteristics or identities. Addressing and preventing such behavior requires robust legal frameworks and societal condemnation. And number nine, we have the global transnational issues. Discrimination is not confined to national boundaries and can occur on a global scale. Issues such as xenophobia, racism, and religious intolerance can have international ramifications and require coordinated efforts to address effectively. And lastly, uh, we have resistance to change. Overcoming discrimination often requires uh, challenging entrenched uh, power structures such as belief, practices, and resistance to change from those who benefit from existing systems of privilege can pose significant obstacle to achieving non-discrimination. Addressing these issues require a multifaceted approach involving legal protections, social awareness, and education. Institutional reforms and advocacy efforts aim at promoting equality and inclusivity. So I would like to um, introduce you ag again to another term, which is uh, human dignity. And I understand that uh, we have already, I have already discussed to you in passing um, the meaning of human dignity in our introductory lecture several weeks ago. And but for the purpose of uh, integrative understanding of all these terms, I would like to uh, present again the meaning of human dignity. So human dignity is a, is a foundational concept in human rights discourse central to the philosophy underlying the protection and promotion of human rights. From a human rights perspective, human dignity refers to the inherent worth and value of every individual simply by virtue of being human. It recognizes the intrinsic dignity of all human beings regardless of their characteristics, circumstances, and status. Here are some key concepts of human dignity from a human rights perspective. Uh, number one is uh, inherent and inalienable. Human dignity is considered inherent to every human being, meaning it is an essential and inherent uh, quality that cannot be uh, granted or taken away by any external authority. It is not contingent upon factors such as nationality, race, gender, religion, or social status. Second, that of universality. Human dignity is universally applicable to all individuals, irrespective of culture, religious, or ideological differences. It forms the basis for the recognition and protection of human rights across diverse societies and contexts. Then, number three, um, autonomy and respect. Human dignity encompasses the idea of autonomy and self-worth, emphasizing the importance of respecting individuals, choices, agency, and integrity. It requires that individuals be treated with respect, fairness, and consideration for their inherent worth as human beings. Then, number four, equality and non-discrimination. Human dignity entails the principle of equality, emphasizing the equal worth and value of every person, 
it prohibits discrimination and ensures that all individuals are entitled to the same rights, opportunities, and protections without prejudice or bias. Then number five, protection from harm and abuse. Human dignity includes the right to be protected from degrading treatment, exploitation, violence, and other forms of abuse. It requires that individuals be treated with compassion, empathy, and dignity, free from any form of degradation or humiliation. Number six, foundational to uh, human rights. Human dignity serves as the foundation for the entire framework of human rights. It underpins the recognition and protection of civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights as enshrined in uh, international human rights instruments, such as the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then, uh, seven, we have the humanitarian values. So human dignity reflects the fundamental humanitarian values such as compassion, empathy, and solidarity. It calls for a collective commitment and upholding the dignity and rights of all individuals, particularly those who are marginalized, vulnerable, and oppressed. Then in summary, human dignity is a core principle of human rights that affirms the inherent worth, autonomy, and equality of every individual. It provides uh, the moral, the philosophical foundation for the protection and promotion of human rights, guiding efforts to create a more just, equitable, and humane world for all people. So that is uh, uh, some of the concepts of human dignity. Another term that uh, we need to uh, pay attention to is the, the term state obligations. So, state obligations refer to the responsibilities and duties that states have under international law, particularly concerning the protection and promotion of human rights. These obligations are derived from the various international treaties, customary international law, and other sources of international legal norms. The three primary categories of state obligations in the context of human rights are number one, you have respect, protect, and fulfill. Respect uh, means that states have the obligation to uh, respect human rights, which means they must refrain from violating and interfering with the enjoyment of human rights by individuals or groups within their jurisdiction. This includes refraining from actions that directly violate human rights, such as torture, arbitrary detention, discrimination, and censorship. Then second, protect, which means that uh, states have a duty to protect individuals and groups from human rights abuses committed by third parties, including non-state actors such as uh, private individuals, corporations, or armed groups. This obligation requires states to take effective measures to prevent, investigate, prosecute, and remedy human rights violation by third parties, and to ensure that those responsible are held accountable. And third, we have this uh, term, fulfill. So states have an obligation to fulfill human rights, which entails taking positive measures to ensure the realization of human rights for all individuals within their jurisdiction. This includes adopting laws, policies, programs, and other measures aimed at creating an enabling environment for the full enjoyment of human rights, such as ensuring access to education, health care, housing, employment, and other social services. State obligations are not limited to actions taken within a state's own territory, but also extend to its extraterritorial conduct, including actions taken abroad in a situation where a state exercises effective control or authority over individuals or territory outside of its borders. Overall, state obligations reflect the duty of states to respect, protect, and fulfill the human rights of all individuals within their jurisdiction 
as enshrined in international human rights law. This obligation serves as the basis for holding states accountable for their actions and ensuring the realization of human rights for all. As uh, we have mentioned earlier, uh, the obligations of the state includes the aspect of protection or to protect. So here are some of the various challenges to this uh, uh, mandate of protect. So number one is the failure to protect. States may struggle to effectively protect individuals and groups from uh, human rights abuses committed by non-state actors such as uh, private individuals, uh, criminal organizations or armed groups, uh, weak governance structures, corruption, and inadequate law enforcement capacities can hinder efforts to prevent and address such abuses. The second challenge is uh, conflict and instability. In conflict-affected areas or in fragile states, Protecting civilians from human rights abuses can be particularly challenging due to ongoing violence, displacement, and breakdowns in governance and security. Civilians, including vulnerable groups such as women, children, and minorities, may be at heightened risk of abuse. Then, we have the corporate accountability. States may face difficulties in regulating the activities of private actors including corporations to ensure that they respect human rights and such as labor exploitation, environmental degradations, and violations of indigenous rights by corporations can pose uh, significant challenges to state efforts to protect human rights. Here are some of the challenges to uh, state obligation to fulfill. Number one is resource constraint. States may lack the financial, human, and institutional resources necessary to fulfill their obligations to progressively realize economic, social, and uh, cultural rights such as the right to education, health care, housing, and employment. Resource constraint can be hinder, uh, also can hinder the development and implementation of policies and programs aimed at improving the living standards and reducing inequalities. Then second is inequality and exclusion. Persistent socioeconomic inequalities and exclusionary policies can impede the efforts to fulfill human rights for all members of society. Marginalized and disadvantaged group may face barriers to accessing essential services and opportunities exacerbating disparities in enjoyment of the rights. Then third is international cooperation. Fulfilling human rights obligations often requires international cooperations and assistance, particularly in addressing global challenges such as poverty, climate change, and pandemics. However, states may struggle to engage in meaningful cooperation due to uh, geopolitical tensions, the lack of political will, or competing priorities. So addressing these issues requires concerted efforts by states, civil society, international organizations, and other stakeholders to strengthen the legal frameworks, improve the governance structures, promote accountability, and foster inclusive development strategies that prioritize human rights for all individuals and groups. Another term we need to uh, be familiar with is international human rights law. This is the body of legal principles and standards that govern the behavior of states and individuals concerning human rights including international treaties, customary law, and principles recognized by the nations. International Human Rights Law, or IHRL, encompasses a wide range of aspects and issues aimed at protecting and promoting the rights and dignity of individuals worldwide. 
Here are some of the key aspects and issues within the scope of IHRL. Uh, number one is uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or the UDHR adopted by um, the United Nations General Assembly in 1948. It serves as the foundation of modern international human rights law and it sets out a comprehensive framework of fundamental human rights and freedoms including civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. Then second is uh, the international uh, human rights treaties. There are numerous international treaties and conventions that codify uh, specific human rights standards and obligations. These include treaties such as the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights or ICCPR, the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights or ICESCR, then the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women or the CEDO and the Convention on the Rights of the Child or CRC. These are just, uh, just some of the many others that there are in the international arena. Then third is state obligations. States are parties to human rights treaties. They are legally bound to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights enshrined, enshrined in these instruments and this includes refraining from violating human rights preventing abuses by third parties and taking positive measures to ensure the realization of rights for all individuals within their jurisdiction then you also have uh, number four you have the non-discrimination non-discrimination is uh, foundational principle of IHRL in, in uh, prohibiting uh, discrimination on the basis of race, ethnicity, sex, religion, disability, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, or any other status. States have an obligation to eliminate discrimination and ensure equality before the law and equal protection of rights for all individuals. Then five, we have the Civil and Political Rights or IHRL. It protects civil and political rights including the right to life, liberty and security of persons, freedom of expression, <coughs> excuse me, uh, assembly and association, and the right to a fair trial, and the prohibition of torture, arbitrary detention, and enforced disappearance. Then number six, we have the Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights or IHRL. Also encompasses the economic, social, and cultural rights such as the right to education, the right to health care, housing, food, water, and work. States are obligated to take progressive measures to ensure the realization of these rights to the maximum of their available resources. Then seven, we have accountability and remedies. This also establishes the mechanisms for holding states accountable for human rights violations and providing remedies to victims. This includes domestic judicial mechanism, international and regional human rights bodies, truth commissions, and international criminal tribunal. Then number eight, we have the international humanitarian law. While uh, primarily this governs the relationship between states and individual, international humanitarian law regulates armed conflict and seeks to protect civilians and combatants during times of war. There is overlap between IHRL and IHL, particularly concerning the protections of certain fundamental rights in situations of armed conflict. Then we have the transnational and global issues. This addresses the transnational and global challenges including migration, uh, refugees, human trafficking, and environmental degradation, climate change, and rights of indigenous peoples. These issues often require international cooperation and coordination to address effectively. And then we have the emerging challenges. 
So the IHRL continues to evolve to address emerging challenges in areas such as technology and digital rights, corporate accountability, bioethics, and intersectionality of discrimination. Adapting human rights framework to respond to these evolving challenges is an ongoing process. Overall, the IHRL plays a crucial role in promoting a culture of respect for human dignity, equality, and justice on a global scale. It provides a framework for addressing violations of human rights, uh, advancing social progress, and building a more inclusive and sustainable world for all individuals and communities. In um, our exploration of human rights, you will encounter the term non-state actors. Because uh, previously, we have said that uh, the main actors in the international uh, relations are the states, the nation states. But aside from the nation states, there are also other entities that are non-state actors. We call them the non-state actors. These are uh, entities other than the governments, that have an impact on human rights such as corporations, armed groups, and international organizations and their responsibilities to respect human rights. Non-state actors play significant roles in various aspects of society, including politics, economics, and culture. Here are some key concepts or key aspects of non-state actors. So, number one, we have uh, the civil society organizations or CSOs. Uh, CSOs including non-governmental organization or, or NGO, community-based organization, CBO, and advocacy groups are critical actors in promoting social change, advancing human rights, and providing services to communities. They often play roles in monitoring government actions, advocating for policy reforms and delivering humanitarian assistance. Then second, we have the private sector entities. This includes uh, corporations, businesses, and other private sector entities. They wield considerable economic power and influence in shaping global development, trade, and governance. They can impact human rights through their operation their supply chains, their labor practices, their environmental policies, and corporate social responsibility initiatives. Then third, we have the armed groups or insurgencies. Uh, Non-state armed groups including rebel factions, insurgent movements, militias, and terrorist organizations operate outside of state control and often engage in uh, violent conflict with governments or with other actors and their activities can have significant humanitarian consequences including human rights abuses, displacement, and civil casualties. Then number four, we have international organizations. While not, uh, while not states themselves, these international organizations such as the United Nations, the World Bank, and the International Monetary Fund, and regional bodies like the European Union, play influential roles in global governance, peacekeeping, development assistance, and humanitarian relief efforts. They often collaborate with states and non-state actors to address transnational challenges. Then number five, we have the social movements. Social movements, grassroots initiatives, and collective actions mobilize individuals and communities around specific causes or grievances such as environmental conservation, gender equality, racial justice, labor rights, and indigenous rights, and they exert pressures on governments, corporations, and other institutions to enact challenge and advance human rights agendas. Then, number six, uh, we have the media and information networks. Media outlets, journalists, online platforms, and information networks shape public discourse disseminate information and hold governments and uh, other actors accountable. They play crucial roles in exposing human rights abuses, promoting transparency, and amplifying the voices of marginalized communities. 
Then seven, we have the religious and cultural institutions. Religious organizations, cultural groups, and spiritual leaders influence social norms, values, and behaviors, often advocating for ethical principles, social justice, and human dignity. They may provide humanitarian assistance, uh, promote interfaith dialogue, and contribute to peace-building efforts in conflict-affected regions. Then number eight, uh, we have the research institutions. Universities and research centers think. Think tanks and other academic experts generate knowledge, conduct research, and provide analysis on human rights issues, policy challenges, and best practices. They contribute to informed decision-making, advocacy campaigns, and capacity-building efforts aimed at advancing human rights and social justice. Then we have the transnational networks and coalition. So non-state uh, non actors often form transnational networks, alliances, and coalitions to collaborate on common objectives, share resources, and amplify their collective impact. These networks may focus on issues such as climate change, uh, migration, human trafficking, or global health, mobilizing resources and expertise across the borders. Number 10, uh, we have the informal and community-based structures. Informal networks, traditional authorities, and community-based structures play vital roles in local governance, conflict resolution, and social cohesion particularly in context where state institutions are weak or inaccessible. They often provide essential services, mediate disputes, and uphold customary norms and practices. Overall, non-state actors contribute to the complexity and dynamism of global governance, human rights advocacy, and social change, exerting influence at local, national, and international level, understanding the role interest and interactions is essential for addressing contemporary challenges and advancing collective efforts to promote peace, justice, and human rights. So another term that we need to also take note is the so-called the right to development. The right to development is a concept within international human rights law that recognizes the fundamental right of individuals and peoples to participate in, contribute to, and enjoy the social, economic, cultural, and political development. It emerges in response to concerns about global inequalities and uh, disparities in access to resources, opportunities, and development outcomes. Here are some of the key aspects and principles associated with the right to development. Number one is uh, universal and inalienable right. So what is universal and inalienable? Okay, so universal and inalienable um, is the right to development that is concerned, considered universal and, in, and inalienable, meaning it applies to all. It applies to all and uh, individuals and peoples without discrimination and cannot be waived or forfeited. <coughs> Another is uh, interdependence and interrelatedness. The right to development is closely linked to other human rights, including civil, political, economic, social, and cultural rights. It emphasizes the interconnectedness of different dimensions of human well-being and the need for comprehensive approach to development that address multiple rights simultaneously. Then we have the participation and empowerment. So the right to development emphasizes the importance of active participation, empowerment, and self-determination of individual and communities in shaping development policies programs and decisions that affect their lives. It calls for inclusive and participatory processes that prioritize the voices and priorities of marginalized and vulnerable groups. Then equity and social justice. 
the right to development emphasizes principles of equity, social justice, and solidarity, aiming to reduce inequalities within and among countries and ensure that development benefits all members of society, particularly those who are most uh, marginalized or disadvantaged. Then, sustainable development. Sustainable development is the right of development which encompasses the principle of uh, sustainable development emphasizing the need to meet the needs of the present generations without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. It promotes environmentally sustainable and socially inclusive development pathways that safeguard natural resources and ecosystem. And number six, we have the international cooperation. The right to development recognizes the importance of international cooperation and assistance in supporting the efforts of developing countries to achieve development goals. It can for equitable and just global uh, partnership, technology transfer, financial assistance, and capacity building initiatives to overcome structural obstacles to development. And seven, we have the accountability and monitoring. Uh, states have an obligation to take measures to realize the right to development, including adopting national development strategies, allocating resources effectively, and implementing policies that prioritize human rights and sustainable development objectives. International mechanisms such as the United Nations, Human Rights Councils Working Group on the Right to Development, monitor and assess progress in the implementation of the right to development. The right to development is enshrined in various international instruments, including the Declaration on the Right to Development adopted by the United Nations General Assembly in 1986. While it is not yet recognized as a legally binding treaty, efforts continue to strengthen its implementation and realization as an integral part of the International Human Rights Framework. <coughs> and here is another term that we need to understand which is um, accountability and remedies. The principles and mechanisms for holding perpetrators of human rights violations accountable and providing justice and reparation to victims. Okay. So, here are some um, aspects of accountability and remedies in the context of human rights. Accountability and remedies are crucial components of the human rights framework, ensuring that uh, individuals have recourse when their rights are violated and that perpetrators are held accountable for their actions. Here are, um, here are some of the key aspects of accountability and remedies in the context of human rights. Number one is uh, the legal framework. So effective accountability and remedies require robust legal framework at both the domestic and international level. This framework should clearly define human rights uh, standards, establish mechanisms for monitoring compliance, and provide avenues for seeking redress and justice. Second is access to justice. Individual must have access to justice mechanisms, including the courts, the tribunals, and administrative bodies where they can seek remedies for human rights violation. Access to justice entails ensuring that legal <coughs> procedures are affordable, timely, transparent, and free from discrimination or intimidation. Then third is judicial remedies. Judicial remedies involve seeking redress through uh, the courts of judicial bodies. This may include compensation for damages, injunctive relief, declaratory judgment, or other forms of legal remedies to address the harm caused by human rights violation. Then, fourth is the non-judicial mechanism. Non-judicial mechanisms such as the national human rights institutions, uh, ombudspersons, truth and reconciliation commissions and mediation or arbitration processes can complement 
judicial remedies and provide alternative avenues for resolving disputes and addressing grievances. Number five is uh, state responsibility. States have a primary obligation to ensure accountability for human rights violations committed within their jurisdiction, including those perpetrated by state agents or non-state actors, and this includes conducting impartial investigations, prosecuting perpetrators, and providing effective remedies to victims. Then number six is uh, corporate accountability. So states have a duty to regulate the activities of private actors, including corporations and businesses, or prevent to prevent human rights abuses and ensure accountability for violations that occur. They may involve implementing legal frameworks, conducting due diligence and holding corporations accountable for their actions through civil or, or criminal proceedings. Seven is international accountability so international mechanisms such as international courts uh, tribunals and treaty bodies play a crucial role in holding states accountable for human rights violation that occur within their jurisdiction or as a result of their actions or omissions these mechanisms may issue judgment recommendations or decisions aimed at remedying violations and preventing recurrence then number eight, we have victim participation. Victim of human rights violation should have the opportunity to participate in accountability processes, including uh, investigation, hearings, and trials. Their participation ensures that uh, their voices are heard, their perspective are considered, and their rights to truth, justice, and reparations are respected. And number nine, we have rep uh, reparations. Reparations are essential components of remedies for human rights violation encompassing measures to provide redress, restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, and satisfaction to victims. Reparations aim to restore the dignity, the rights, and well-being of victims and address, them, uh, address harm caused by the violations and intend to follow up and monitoring. So, Effective accountability requires ongoing follow-up and monitoring to ensure that remedies are implemented, perpetrators are held accountable, and systemic reforms are undertaken to prevent recurrence of violations, and civil society organizations, human rights defenders, and international actors play uh, critical roles in monitoring compliance and advocating for accountability. Then, overall, accountability and remedies are integral to the protection and promotion of human rights, providing essential mechanism for ensuring justice, redress, and accountability for victims of violations, while also contributing to the prevention of future abuses. So, thank you very much, my friends, for listening to this lecture. And we are now ready for your questions and whatever ideas that you would like to share with uh, everyone.